So hello and welcome to our podcast. And it's a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Leo Galland. He's a board-certified internist practicing in New York City and who is recognized as a world leader in functional and integrative medicine and a pioneer in the study of intestinal permeability and the gut microbiome as they impact immune function and systemic health. So since the beginning of the pandemic, Dr. Galant has devoted most of the time to research on COVID-19 and to the education of other health practitioners in understanding the complex biology of the disease. Just recently, Dr. Galland joined our Board of Medical Advisors at the Long COVID Foundation. So Dr. Galland, thank you very much for being with us. It's such a great honor to have you on our channel. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share this information, Valentina. Thank you. So today we're gonna have a very complex topic to discuss. So many of our listeners are waiting to hear about the damage that COVID can do to the brain. Um, many say that after COVID and long haul phase, people can no longer do things they did before simply because they don't know how to do them. So there have been studies in the UK that showed that COVID-19 has got significant impact on brain function and cognition. So we know that you have studied this research to understand this in details, and we would be delighted to hear from you where people's symptoms like forgetfulness, brain fog can lead to if nothing is done. So time is yours, please. Okay, thank you. I'm going to share the screen. Okay, so I've, I've devoted a lot of thinking to the issue of what happens to the brain after COVID-19. Um, and there's been a fair amount of research, actually, that can guide us in understanding what happens, why it happens, and that suggests therapies that may be helpful. And one of the issues that got a lot of attention over the summer was the question of whether COVID-19 could actually increase the risk of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, this was based in, on studies in people over the age of 60 that were done in the U.S. and that showed an increase in forgetfulness, which the part that's um, concerning is this was unrelated to the severity of, a co of acute COVID. That is, if someone is really sick, you know, they're in an intensive care unit, they're on a, a ventilator, we would expect that it's going to take time for that person to recover. But this involved people who had not been very sick. And even those who were hospitalized, which was a study from NYU, found that it, it did not require severe illness to, pro to produce an increase in markers in the blood that are associated with Alzheimer's disease. The University of Texas study of people who had not been very sick did find a relationship to loss of smell. And I think that's significant when we look at the two studies that you had referenced from the UK, which are very important studies. Um, one was made possible because of the UK Biobank database. Uh, there were 40,000 people who had had MRIs done of the brain shortly before the pandemic. And several hundred of them were offered the opportunity to get repeat MRIs several months into the pandemic. Um, and about half of them had had tested positive for COVID-19 and the other half had not and had not been sick. Um, and they were matched for age, sex, ethnic background and the interval between the scans. And those people who had had COVID-19 and then recovered, and most of them only 15 out of 394 had required hospitalization. So these were mild to moderate cases. When they looked at the group, there were changes in the MRI compared to the control group from before the pandemic to after COVID-19. And what those changes indicated was a loss of brain cells, gray matter, in certain parts of the brain and What's important about these parts of the brain are that they're involved in regulating some higher 
cognitive functions like spatial memory and complex decision making. They also are parts of the brain that are directly related to the sense of smell and taste. We know that the olfactory nerves, which start at the back and top of the nose, carry the sense of smell to the brain. And we know that the loss of smell is frequently a problem with COVID-19. So these nerves offer a direct route for the virus to enter the brain. Correlates with some, another UK finding with, in which um, neuropsychiatric testing was done online, tests of, of higher brain function with thousands and thousands of people, actually 84,000 people in the UK did this. Some of them had had COVID-19, some of them hadn't. And in this case, they matched people for their age, their gender, their education level, their income, um, pre-existing medical disorders, and their racial or ethnic group. Uh, and they found that when they compared the people who had had COVID-19 with people who had not had COVID-19, there were multiple areas of cognitive function that were impaired. And it was most pronounced on tests that assessed verbal problem solving and visual selective attention. Now, if you think about it, spatial memory is related to visual selective attention and um, problem solving that is cognitive, making complex cognitive decisions is related to verbal problem solving. So these areas that were damaged by the presence of COVID-19 are showing up in this testing as being functionally impaired. Now, there may be other types of cognitive problems that people experience after COVID-19 and that they describe as brain fog, but the ability to make complex decisions and um, to be oriented in space are certainly two important um, aspects of what is impaired when people talk about brain fog. Um, so the, the data su suggest that what happens with COVID-19 is that the virus directly gets into the brain and produces abnormalities in the brain. Now, these abnormalities are very different from what occurs in the lungs. Um, even after a mild infection, there can be damage to important cognitive centers of the brain, and they may persist for some time. Um, this is one of the most historically concerning things. The 1918 influenza pandemic, there were epidemics of neurologic disease that occurred, uh, and they were, um, became well-known about 30 years ago with the um, publication of Oliver Sacks's best-selling book, Awakenings, and a movie of the same name, same name, which starred Robert De Niro and Robin Williams, somebody who had developed this encephalitis after the uh, flu pandemic of 1918. The concerning thing is that there were new diagnoses of flu-based brain disease that occurred for a decade after the pandemic. And the peak of the new diagnoses was four years later. So we don't know if the post-COVID cognitive decline is gonna show a similar pattern. And if we are only seeing the beginning of what this virus um, can do to the brain. Now, when COVID-19 affects the brain, the inflammation that's produced is very mild and the number of viral particles is very low. As I said before, this is very different from what we see in the lung where there are a lot of viral particles and there's really robust inflammation. The response in the brain is that the brain actually just loses nerve cells, neurons. They just drop out through a process that's been called apoptosis. It's a very quiet cell death. There's not um, a major encephalitis or a strong inflammatory response 
Um, it's just gradual and subtle. There is a solution to this kind of low inflammation apoptosis, loss of brain cells, which is to stimulate the production of a protein, an endogenous factor that the brain makes. It is part of the way the brain responds to trauma and injury. And it permits the survival of nerve cells. And it also strengthens the connections to other nerve cells. And this is a protein called BDNF or brain derived neurotropic factor. You can measure brain derived neurotrophic factor in blood. It doesn't necessarily tell you uh, very sensitively what happens in the brain. But with COVID 19 and people who become very ill, there is a decline in blood levels. Uh, as people recover, the blood levels return to normal. But we don't know what happens to the brain levels. And you probably need more than normal brain levels in order to boost cognitive function. So does it mean that the damage that COVID does to the brain and cognitive function itself is reversible? Oh, oh yes, it's, it is reversible. And um, I've seen it reversed in so many ways and in, um, in people who have the post-COVID brain fog. Um, <clears throat> and I don't think we understand everything about that damage. Um, BDNF, I think, is central, but there may be some things that are continuing to suppress BDNF after COVID that are very hard to measure. Um, inflammation, for example, might be persisting. Low-grade chronic inflammation suppressing BDNF and, and at a level that it's not going to show up on most blood tests. So I, I do believe that reversal of inflammation is always important for recovery from COVID-19. Um, BDNF is one particular factor that I target to try and enhance brain recovery. Um, so there's a major impact of diet on BDNF. And there's also a major impact of diet on, um, on inflammation in the body. And the bacteria that live in the gut, the gut microbiome, turns out play a very important role in regulating BDNF and systemic inflammation. One of the links is a chemical that is produced by intestinal bacteria. And they, it's the, a chemical called butyrate or butyric acid. It is a short chain volatile fat, fatty acid um, that stimulates the brain to increase the production of BDNF. Um, now, butyrate is produced in the large intestine by the action of normal healthy bacteria that um, ferment carbohydrate. And the carbohydrate that they like the most is present in the form of fiber. So that high fiber diets enhance the production of butyrate when you have the right bacteria in the large intestine. Now, one of the problems with COVID is that these bacteria tend to be negatively affected by the presence of COVID in the GI tract. Yeah, so it does seem that the illness become multi-systemic and we need to start treating microbiome first in order to improve the uh, cognitive function of the brain. So yes, it's important to keep in mind that uh, people who are post-COVID, they need to look after their diets and help in any possible way to treat that gut first. So that's very important. Yes, this is a very complex multi-layered disease, COVID-19, both in the acute phase and certainly in long COVID. And the gut is really important to, to the process of healing. And what seems to be most important in the gut is the presence of bacteria that produce butyrate. Butyrate, because it is of the type of chemical it is, diffuses very readily 
from the intestine into the body. It travels throughout the body where it has anti-inflammatory effects and it gets into the brain where it is not only anti-inflammatory, it stimulates production of BDNF and it increases a process called neuroplasticity, which is the brain's ability to generate new connections after they've been damaged. Uh, and, and a typical Western diet, such as is consumed in the UK, Western Europe and the US has been shown in mice to impair neuroplasticity. Um, so you need to, you know, you need to be eating a very healthy plant-based diet. Now that may or may not be easy for you to do. There are some other things you can do if, um, in addition to diet. And one of my favorite in the setting of COVID-19 is um, a bioflavonoid called curcumin, which is found in the spice turmeric. Um, and curcumin actually has been shown to boost memory, not only in animals, but in human clinical controlled studies. In animals, it raises the level of BDNF in the brain and it increases the reactivity and survival of nerve cells. Um, and um, stress and the steroids that are released by stress actually reduce BDNF. So um, a lot of people who get COVID-19 receive steroids as part of the treatment, especially if they're quite ill. That's gonna diminish neuroplasticity and it's gonna um, decrease levels of BDNF in the brain Curcumin can protect against that. Um, and there's a study, there have been two studies on the use of curcumin in acutely ill hospitalized patients with COVID-19, randomized controlled clinical trials, one from Iran and one from India recently published, which showed a marked protective effect of curcumin in addition to standard care on um, the recovery, survival and recovery from acute COVID-19. So, um, I mean, I think curcumin is something people should be supplementing with before they get COVID-19, if they get COVID-19 and afterwards for protecting, for being anti-inflammatory and protecting the brain. The doses needed, if you're probably about a thousand milligrams a day. Clinical trials of curcumin in humans have shown that it elevates BDNF in blood. This is, out, this is not in people with COVID-19. These are uh, studies that were published before the pandemic. But in people with diabetes, who to begin with have depressed BDNF, uh, 500 to 750 milligrams uh, daily was shown to raise their BDNF levels to normal. In women with premenstrual syn syndrome, it was found that BDNF was low during the premenstrual phase, the late luteal phase, and that curcumin at a similar dose increased the level of BDNF in blood and relieved the symptoms of uh, PMS. And in people with depression, a thousand milligrams a day of curcumin was found to raise plasma BDNF, and the BDNF in people with depression is, is depressed, and it raised it up to normal, and it also improved their clinical response to antidepressant drugs. It didn't substitute for the drugs, but the drugs work better. Exercise has a very positive effect on, on BDNF, at least in laboratory studies. Now, of course, if you have long COVID, you have to be really careful with exercise because so many people get worse with exercise. And you need to be very careful. You need to gauge your exercise carefully so that you do not crash after your exercise. And if you do that, you vote. If walking half a mile leads to a crash, you're doing too much exercise. Try walking an eighth of a mile and then a quarter mile. You really need to rest and build up very slowly. Um, but if you are able to exercise, exercise, in laboratory studies have been shown to help. And vitamin B3, niacin, stimulates the production of BDNF. 
we don't exactly know what the mechanisms are. It may be a direct mechanism. It may also be that niacin is important for the function of powerhouses, energy powerhouses in the body called mitochondria. And mitochondria are very important for brain function. And niacin plays a critical role in mitochondrial, in stimulating mitochondrial function. The, um, another substance that's been shown to raise BDNF in humans is whole coffee fruit concentrate, um, 100 milligrams a day. There's a proprietary product that's out there. It's pretty low in caffeine. It's not the caffeine that's doing it. It's probably the flavonoids and other polyphenols that are in the, that are in the, in the coffee bean. Now, omega-3 fats can play an important role. They're, um, and it doesn't matter whether these are fish oils or animal-derived omega-3s because fish oils have been shown to benefit memory in humans con controlled clinical trials. The benefits have been attributed to both to the combination of EPA and DHA, which are the long chain fatty acids, essential fats that are in the fish oil, but alpha linolenic acid, which is a vegetable omega based omega three, it's found in flax seed and chia seed and hemp seed. Um, alpha linolenic acid in an animal model of stroke has been shown to help recovery and increase the level of BDNF in the brain. So if you can't take fish oils or don't wanna take fish oils, you can use these seeds, freshly ground flax, chia, uh, or hemp seed. Now the dose matters if you're gonna use fish oils um, and you have cognitive problems. 1200 milligrams a day of EPA plus DHA had no effect in a human clinical trial. It took 2,200 milligrams a day in healthy older adults to enhance memory. And in people with Alzheimer's disease, it took 3,000 milligrams a day combined with alpha lipoic acid, which is an antioxidant at a dose of 600 milligrams a day to slow the cognitive decline during Alzheimer's. Alpha lipoic acid has a number of beneficial effects as an antioxidant. I generally recommend 3,000 milligrams a day of EPA plus DHA and 600 milligrams a day of alpha lipoic acid to try and improve cognitive function after COVID-19. There's another bioflavonoid uh, different from curcumin called physetin, which um, has been shown to enhance neuroplasticity. Its effects on BDNF have not been studied. The food that has the greatest number of physetin is strawberries. One cup of strawberries has 25 milligrams of physetin. And there's a, a comprehensive review from the Salk Institute um, in San Diego. They looked at all of the preclinical work, that is the laboratory work on physetin, in which it prevents the development and progression of many neurologic disorders and can reduce age-associated memory changes in the brain. Physetin in food promotes hippocampal neuroplasticity. The hippocampus is the memory center of the brain. Uh, this is in animals. In a study of people who had had a stroke, 100 milligrams of physetin a day for seven days, now that's the same as eating basically four cups of strawberries a day, improved the outcome of treatment and reduced markers of inflammation in the blood. I think physetin is a really important nutrient in recovery from COVID-19. A colleague of mine and I designed a shake that we call a high physetin smoothie with strawberries, blueberries, green tea, and a bunch of other, several other greens that have it. And I've used it with patients who have had cognitive problems um, and been surprisingly impressed by number one, how well it tastes. People love to take it. And the changes that, it, that people have noted over time. Physetin is also available as a dietary supplement. Now there's another bioflavonoid called luteolin, which has been shown to have many mechanisms of neuroprotection. Again, specific effect on BDNF hasn't been studied. Um, but in um, luteolin is anti-inflammatory it stabilizes some 
cells in the immune system called mast cells that are involved in the inflammatory response to COVID-19. And there's been a lot of interest in the role of mast cells in um, contributing to the inflammation of long COVID. Um, luteolin gets into the brain. If it's consumed in a liposomal form, it's not readily absorbed. You need a lot of it if you're just trying to get it from food. But a liposomal preparation of luteolin does get into the brain. There are several products that are available, pure luteolin or luteolin mixed with other flavonoids. Um, in animal models, it's reverse learning and memory deficits. And in a human clinical trial, where it was combined with mangiferin, it was shown to enhance sprint performance, muscle oxygen extraction, and oxygen delivery to the brain in, in athletes. The doses used were 45 and 90 milligrams. 45 milligrams of luteolin work well. The, the food with the greatest concentration of luteolin is celery. And I've wondered whether um, there's a certain infatuation with celery juice in the US, whether um, people aren't juicing stalks of celery to get luteolin as one way, as one delivery system. Just talking about brain oxygenation, Aside from direct entry into the brain through the nose, the other way that COVID-19 impacts the brain is through blood vessels and probably by inducing inflammation of the blood vessels in the brain and clogging them because blood clots are an important part of what COVID does in the body. Enhancing oxygenation of the brain is really important for COVID recovery. Another plant-derived substance that's been shown to help cognitive function is resveratrol. In the US National Library of Medicine, there are 15 randomized controlled clinical trials on the ability of resveratrol to enhance cognition. They almost all show, show positive effects. And what's amazing to me is the wide range of um, doses that are used. Uh, ordinarily, resveratrol is thought not to be very well absorbed. Yet in a study of postmenopausal women, 75 milligrams a day, which is a pretty low dose, was found to enhance blood flow in the brain and cognitive function. And that is something that we're looking for after recovery from COVID. In older adults, 200 milligrams of resveratrol a day improves memory and hippocampal, what this phenomenon called hippocampal functional connectivity, which is the ability to link memories at a thousand milligrams a day, but not 300, psychomotor speed, which is the speed of response, verbal responses to cues was enhanced. And in, in um, veterans suffering from Gulf War syndrome, which may have some similarities to post-COVID, there was an improvement in doses of 200 and 600 milligrams a day. Um, and resveratrol in animal studies has been shown to enhance neuroplasticity. To summarize, the, this is what I recommend, a whole foods, low sugar diet, high in vegetables and omega-3 fats from fish and some of the seeds I mentioned, walnuts, also an excellent source of plant-based omega-3s, supplementation with prebiotics, probiotics, and also with butyrate. Butyrate is available as a supplement. Um, regular exercise is tolerated. Of all the exercises that have been studied, swimming seems to have the um, greatest enhancing effect on BDNF and cognitive function. And possibly, I mean, I know I've seen a lot of patients who cannot tolerate exercising on land, but they can, but if they have access to a pool, they can begin to exercise in the water. Um, supplementation with bioflavonoids like curcumin, fisetin, and luteolin, and with resveratrol. Now, many of these supplements have an additional beneficial effect, which is curcumin and resveratrol in particular, 
omega-3 fats also directly or indirectly enhance the function of an enzyme called ACE2, which is most people know these days is the receptor on the cell for COVID-19. COVID-19 enters your cells by attaching to ACE2 and it destroys it in the process. And these supplements and this dietary pattern can help to restore ACE2. So I think there are multiple levels of benefits from this protocol, BDNF, control of inflammation, and restoration of ACE2 activity. Thank you very much. That was very informative. It's a pleasure to know that uh, there are things that people can do, not just, you know, sit and wait till there will be a magic medicine available for restoring their cognitive function. And there are these little helpers that can help restore the brain function. And it's easily available in any country and just people need to consider to take those. The important question is, during the pandemic, we see that many people go and see their general practitioners and complain about the cognitive function and memory and uh, anxiety. And as a first solution, for some reason, they are put on antidepressants as a first-line treatment in long COVID due to these symptoms. What do you think about this approach? Well, there may be a role for antidepressants in the treatment of long COVID, just as there may be in the treatment of depression. In the work that I do and from my perspective, the foundation for treating either depression or long COVID is lifestyle, diet. Um, Depression itself is associated with inflammation. I think decisions about the use of medications like antidepressants need to be made on an individual basis. Um, There's certainly, the role that they play with long COVID I think is fairly small. I've seen antidepressants, for example, improve um, sometimes cognitive function, but symptoms like POTS, you know, the, the, um, the rapid heart rate that occurs when a person is standing up. Now that's, and, and in the conventional medical approach, antidepressants are sometimes found to be useful with POTS. So uh, I think that this is such um, a complex and potentially devastating disease that I don't take anything off the table. I've seen, I've seen patients who, re- who responded dramatically well to being vaccinated with long COVID. And this has been described. Of course, I've also seen patients who got much worse. And so it's yeah, this it's is so hard to predict. It's um, hard to but, explain why why people get better after the vaccine. Yeah. Well, I, you know, there is a theory that was recently put forward by a researcher at the University of Arkansas, who I communicated with after seeing his work. W- what his laboratory identified were autoantibodies. I mean, a lot of labs have demonstrated that COVID-19 is associated with a lot of autoimmune phenomena phenomena at all levels and, and that it may impact the outcome of infection in many ways. But what they documented in people who had recovered as well as people who were sick was, the, was in about 80% the presence of autoantibodies to ACE2. And these autoantibodies actually were capable of um, interfering with ACE2 activity. Um, And they had a theory about the origin of these autoantibodies because the spike protein has a domain called the receptor binding domain, which is what it uses to enter cells. And it locks into ACE2, you know, like a key into a lock. And the levels of these um, autoantibodies to ACE2 correlated the levels of the autoantibodies of, of the antibodies to the spike protein. Um, and so there was a whole theory about how this complex phenomenon of antibodies and then antibodies to the antibodies to, to, a, to a part of the antibodies. These are things, these take, these are part of something called immune networks, 
you really have to be an immunologist to understand and most doctors don't understand immune networks. It's pretty challenging, but it is possible that the vaccines by stimulating the production of antibodies to spike protein are somehow altering the function of the immune networks that are contributing to long COVID. And so it's you know kind of like bowling with your eyes closed. If you, you might get a strike, or the bowl, you know, or the ball may fall into the gutter. We don't really know what we're doing, but if you're lucky, and so far in my experience, um, there have been twice as many people who benefited as who were hurt by the vaccines who had long COVID. I don't know how those statistics will hold up. If you're lucky, the vaccine will somehow alter the function of the immune network and allow you to break free. And, and I mean, I've seen, I've seen people who said, yeah, it was like three or four days or maybe a week after the second shot, all of a sudden they were different. Uh, you know, I mean, that's the closest thing that I've seen happen to a mir miracle cure for this. When it occurs, unfortunately, not frequently enough. We uh, still need to do lots of research to understand the COVID impact on brain and potentially underlying conditions that people had before COVID so that um, when they are in this long haul phase, the symptoms of forgetfulness and memory loss wouldn't be led to Parkinsonism and dementia because we know that some people have symptoms of early Parkinsonism and dementia when they're in long COVID phase. So the supplements that you have discussed today, will they help to prevent that further development of uh, potential dementia? Well, I mean, that's, that's their goal, of course. Um, is there evidence that they will do that? I mean, that would take years and it would take controlled studies. Um, and we don't have time for that. I, I definitely think there needs to be intensive focused research on long COVID. It's urgent. It's not something that can wait. What we do know if we take something like Parkinson's disease is that there's a major impact of what happens in the large intestine, in the colon, the gut, on Parkinson's disease. This is being intensively studied and it has a lot to do with inflammation in the gut and the impact of gut bacteria on, in the colon and then as it influences the brain. Now, Parkinson's uh, and a group of disorders that are related to Parkinson's may not be identical with COVID-19, but if someone develops COVID-19 and then starts to develop symptoms that are Parkinsonian, the lessons learned from the studies of Parkinson's and the gut should definitely be applied uh, to try and help that person. Yeah. High fiber diets, the production of butyrate, um, the decrease of inflammation in the colon, a balancing of the bacterial species is very important. And it's, that's not gonna be the same for everybody. That is the species that are important for treating one condition may not be important for the others. I think that those who have issues with brain after COVID, I would strongly advise not just sit and wait till severe damage potentially can happen. And they just need to have appropriate treatment. And uh, I think the work that we do at the foundation is to communicate that information to people who suffer as well as medical practitioners. So. I hope you find it useful and um, please take this information out to your practitioners and help us raise awareness about long COVID and its impact on people's well-being. So thank you very much, Dr. Galant, for this presentation and this information you have given to us. And uh, I hope people will find it useful. So thank you and goodbye. Goodbye and thank you for the work that you're doing.